Welcome back to our 2021 virtual event series. My name is Madison Davsevich, and we are in the midst of the 2021 expedition season. And for the next few months, these op events will be opportunities to hear about the excitement of expeditions, preview the stories coming to you from sea, meet and engage with inspiring teams from OET's core of exploration, and learn about the science, technology, engineering, and history that excites them. We're so glad to have you joining via Facebook and YouTube, You'll be able to ask questions of our explorers by adding those comments and questions below. And let's start off by letting us know where in the world you're watching from. We love hearing from you and, and seeing where we have visitors coming in from. If you joined us yesterday to hear about the exciting and unusual expedition underway on Nautilus right now, then you heard about a technology testing mission. Supported by the NOAA Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute, our team has joined with Woods Hole Oceani Oceanographic Institution to test new operations combining autonomous vehicles and remotely operated vehicles together to push forward towards the cutting edge boundary of what's possible in ocean exploration. Today, we're gonna to take a deeper look at Mesobot, which is an autonomous vehicle, meaning it's an untethered self-driving vehicle that's on board the ship right now. And we've invited some of the team here to chat today to answer your questions about their experience on board and what's driving their inspiration as deep sea explorers. First off, we have Dr. Dana Yur and Molly Curran. Molly Curran is a mechanical engineer and the first pilot for the Mesobot. Let's jump right in. Tell us what we're looking at and what this awesome technology is. Okay, well, we, you know, we're here on the back deck of the Nautilus. This is uh, Mesobot. You're actually looking at the tail end of it. These are the two, two of the big aft propellers. They turn to push it forward. It has uh, vertical propellers here. And, and I'm going to tell you something special about these in a second. Um, and then on the front, we have the business end, if you will, uh, cameras. These two cameras here uh, are uh, for the stereo system. So like we have two eyes, Mesobot has two eyes. So we can actually measure its distance from targets in the water. And then this is what we call our science camera. And uh, it can take uh, a 4K and HD uh, video. And of course, we have to bring our own lights. So here we have uh, top light and bottom light, and they can be either white or red. Last night they were red. Uh, and if you might wonder why we use red lights, that's because most most uh, deep sea animals uh, can't see red. So we can actually be a little less intrusive to the animals. A big part of Mesobot is actually trying not to disturb the animals. Molly, why don't you tell uh, people about the thrusters because they have some <laughs> special qualities uh, that enable them to not uh, disturb the animals. Yeah, thanks, Dana. Uh, so as, as Dana had mentioned, these are these are really unique thrusters. Um, and what's cool about them is uh, a typical thruster is um, high speed, low torque. Um, but these thrusters, we've actually had them special made so that they are high torque, low speed. So when the vehicle is going through the water, it's actually moving these these propellers really slowly. Uh, so they'll be spinning in the water column and and hopefully you know, creating the thrust that the vehicle needs to move around, but not disturbing the environment around Mesobot. So not not scaring off or pushing away or blowing away those those animals that we're trying to track um, by using these these uh, slow moving thrusters. Right. So anyway, uh, uh, and um, we uh, those thrusters they they actually worked quite last well last night. We just busted open the data when we got the vehicle on board. Uh, the vehicle uh, behaved quite well. Um, and uh, you're going to hear about e eDNA from uh, Dr. Annette Govindarajan, who's also on the call. Uh, Molly, why don't you point out the sampler? Uh, so when Annette starts talking about that, people can uh, see, uh, can understand what that is. Yeah, so in, in the bottom of the vehicle here, we have our, our sampling payload area. Um, and so right now we've got we've got three of these samplers set up on here. Um, and each sampler has um, several of, you can see these, these uh, samplers within them uh, with the filter and the pump, and the motor, and um, these, these will be running uh, throughout our mission. Um, 
And as as you see, and they're open to the wherever Mesobot goes, these samplers will be um, looking, taking in the water, and Annette will tell us more about that uh, in a little bit. Right. Um, oh, and there's another, and you're going to hear from Dr. Alan Adams, who's uh, also another one of our Shoreside collaborators. And uh, he and uh, his colleague, Jake Bernstein, uh, built these wonderful radiometers that we carry on the Mesobot. And by radiometer, you can think light meter, okay? Uh, so it measures the amount of light in the ocean. And you might wonder why we're so obsessed about that. Uh, and Alan, Dr. Alan Adams is going to tell you more about that later. Let me just say that that these instruments are so sensitive that they can count individual photons. Um, and why why would anybody care to do that? Well, that's what the animals, the, those light levels are what are driving the animals up and down every day in the ocean. So Mesobot can see like the deep sea animals can see. Um, and in robotics, we, we have a lot of debates about how much are the machines that we build should or shouldn't mimic nature. Okay, and in Mesobot, it doesn't look like a fish. It doesn't look like a jellyfish, um, but it can see like one. Okay, and that's very important. That's great. And we have, there's so much interest from our viewers. Um, it's absolutely incredible. A lot of folks are saying that Mesobot is cute and I absolutely have to agree. Um, where, was, where did you get the idea for this? I mean, what, you know, where were these, what was previously exploring these regions and, and what inspired this new technology? Well, uh, I go back to a, a sort of casual, uh, unplanned conversation. Uh, it was myself, uh, Dr. Govindarajan, who's on the call right now, and Dr. Larry Maiden, who was uh, actually our vice president for research at the time. But his passion was always with midwater animals. And he was actually a pioneer of what we call blue water scuba, where people did scuba diving in the middle of the ocean to study these animals. And he made an almost offhand comment uh, to Annette and I. He said, he said, Dana, can you make a robot that can show me what I missed when I ran out of air? Um, and that started the whole project. Uh, Larry's inspiration got uh, Annette thinking about well, the science it could accomplish. And of course, I was immediately obsessed with all the cool things that it could do technologically that, yeah, our friends at Ambari and Stanford ha have train their vehicles to follow animals around. We can team up with them. We can make a robot that can follow animals around in the ocean. Uh, and then we, we, of course, we had to flesh out that agenda quite a bit to make it something that would be viable, that we could write a proposal and raise the large amounts of money to build something like this. Um, but that's actually the, 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 the origin. And I think that story tells you a lot about how science and technology works, especially at a place like the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. We make big plans, but then w we have these random encounters with smart people from different fields. And, and we we uh, springboard off of off of their ideas and 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 we make them happen. Absolutely. And speaking of following animals around, we have a question from a viewer who wants to know what is the max distance the mesobot can go. The maximum depth, uh, Molly. M Molly, by the way, built uh, Molly and Justin Fuji. Uh, built a lot of the mechanical systems. So when I need to know an answer to a question like that, I ask them rather than having them shake their heads while I while I give the wrong answer. Molly. Yeah. So the vehicle is designed to go down to a thousand meters, um, and and there's a couple aspects of the vehicle that that you know determine that depth. Um, one is the foam on top here. This is syntactic foam, and so the density of the foam is is designed for that depth of operation. Um, inside, under these, these are skins right here, uh, and underneath this skin is a pressure housing. That pressure housing has all of our electronics in it and uh, connectors that come out that go to our various components. So the connectors will go to the cameras and the thrusters and the samplers and, and all of the brains of the robot are inside of that pressure housing. And uh, don't forget the batteries. And yep, and yep. almost most importantly, the batteries are yep. inside of that pressure housing. Uh, and the, the, that pressure housing was designed for the depth of a thousand meters. Um, so it can withstand the pressures down there. Uh, and like Dana said, we've got um, batteries as it is an autonomous vehicle, we've got the batteries on board uh, and the batteries and, and all the brains are inside of that housing. Um, various other little components have been also tested down to and designed down to a thousand meters, like the camera housings, 
the lights, um, the thrusters, and and before we put everything onto the vehicle, we actually uh, pressure test it down to that depth and and then some to make sure that it can withstand that, uh, and then remount it all in the vehicle. That's awesome. And there's so much technology and, and so many different things at play. And a few of our viewers have questions just about how Mesabot interacts with the animals around it. One being, what system does it have um, in order to avoid potential animals? And another, how loud is it when it's actually operating? Well, actually, we want to make some formal noise measurements. We haven't uh, gotten quite to there. We have colleagues uh, at Woods Hole who are experts in that. So uh, we do plan on doing a thorough uh, acoustic survey. It's it's pretty quiet. It's a lot quieter than than our, our big ROVs. We know that just casually. Um, and the, the other thing, so the, when the motors are turning, again, as Molly mentioned, they turn quite slowly. Um, but also the algorithms that control those are, are um, they're pretty simple, but they work extremely well. And one of the things that I'm very proud of is that the, the, the thrusters, they, they, they turn very smoothly. And if you look at the Mesobot from above, as, as our colleague, Dr. Alan Adams got to do uh, when he was scuba diving over the vehicle in Bermuda on a beautiful day, um, everyone who's, when we watch it in the tank or, or even when we're lucky enough to actually watch it in the ocean, it has a kind of gentleness to it that, that's really important. The thrusters, they, they aren't surging, they aren't ramping up and ramping down. They're moving very gently and very smoothly. And all of that makes the vehicle quiet and, and makes it disturb the water less. We also have some very sophisticated motor controllers um, that that are uh, that also don't generate noise. But your average motor controller kind of sounds like a little bit like a buzzsaw. These are very quiet and uh, we found them they're, they're made to power uh, electric scooters. <laughs> if you can believe it, the most sophisticated motor controller that we could find for these motors is an open source motor controller. They cost under $100 uh, and they're used uh, uh, for electric scooters. <laughs> so, and if you, compare, <laughs> if you compare the motors running on those to running on a standard controller, they're not quite silent, but they're they're very quiet. So we work very hard at, at, at keeping the vehicle quiet. Um, and then we mentioned the red lights. That's very important. And then it's vaguely hydrodynamic in its shape. We have we have some practical compromises. Um, it's not as streamlined as uh, as you know uh, a sea lion, which we've seen around today, or or a dolphin, uh, uh, because we have some. Um, compromises we have to make for practicality. For example, it has it has these skids, these legs, if you will, so that we can sit it down on the deck uh, when we bring it aboard and we can move it around the shop. And, and so, you know, we have to make some practical compromises, but we try to make it so it doesn't stir up the water a lot. Absolutely. It sounds like you guys have thought about nearly everything when it comes to designing this robot. Molly, we have um, a viewer question for you. What are some, what's the biggest challenge you've found in designing robots to work in the deep sea? Oh, the biggest challenge for designing robots, um, you know, every, every robot is, is different. So uh, you come across different challenges um, with, with everything you're doing. And I'd say that's, that's one of the biggest challenges is, is, um, you know, everything you do is different. So you can't really, you can't say, okay, let's do that same exact thing for this other robot. You know, you have to adapt it and you have to look at the goals of the robot and the group and and the system and um, adapt what you already know to try and uh, make the best design the best whatever it might be for uh, for for the robot that you're currently working on or the system that it might be um, but that's also one of the coolest aspects of our job is that everything's changing you know we, we design something once and then and then we're just looking to make something else better and, and more exciting and, and um, you know, just advance that technology um, every time we do something. I'd like to just compliment that a little bit with, <clears throat> when, when we first started, my colleague Al Bradley at Woods Hole and I, when we first got our first AUV Abe to work, someone at a, at a conference asked uh, Dr. Bradley, they said, what was the hardest thing uh, with Abe? And Al sat and he thought for a second and then he said, getting all the pieces to work at the same time. Yeah. Uh, you know, these are complicated machines. There's a lots of things. Imagine if, imagine if every test you took in school 
you know, if you didn't get a 98 or a 99, you flunked. Okay. That's, that's AUVs. Uh, all, there's a lot of details. There's not a lot of redundancy. Um, and so we have to work really hard to, you know, every instrument in the orchestra has to be in tune uh, and, and playing all the right notes uh, or we're not going to get the result that we want. Yeah. And as, as Dana said, you know, it is, it's, it's a, a team effort. You know, we've got mechanicals, we've got electricals, we've got software. And, and if everyone isn't working closely together, then you're not going to succeed. Uh, everyone, even, even if I don't know all the details about the software and Dana doesn't know all the details yeah. about the mechanical design, it's, it's really important that we have that communication and, and we uh, are working really closely together to, to mesh it all to make the best thing that we can make. Yeah, let's, uh, let me just put that a little more bluntly. If Molly sees me out here with a wrench, <laughs> she's probably going to tackle me. <laughs> uh, you know, we all have our we all have our contributions to make, but we also are very respectful of each other's expertise. And I find that's a big part of making the team work um, is you know having confidence and trust um, in in all the other people that 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 you need to make all the things work. So excited to continue exploring this um, new technology. And speaking of team, I want to move on to another member of your team, Dr. Alan Adams. You mentioned him as well. And we've heard several times about how Mesobot will be working in the dim and dark portions of the ocean throughout this expedition. Uh, you're le Dr. Adams, Alan, <laughs> you're leading the research using the onboard instrument called a radiometer. Can you describe what that is and what does it do? Yeah, absolutely. So the the radiometer um, is uh, it's an instrument to measure the light levels in the deep ocean. Um, and the as Dana mentioned, uh, the fish in the ocean are dominated, or their behavior is, is dominated by a small number of things. What other fish are doing and light levels. You know, if you go to if you go to the plains in Africa and and you look at a herd of animals, their their motion is governed by the geography. You know, where's their valleys and by the water, where are their watering holes? And in the ocean, we don't have, in the mid ocean, we don't have the geography and we don't have the watering holes. What we have is light levels, right? That tell you how bright it is and how likely you are to be eaten, predated upon. And we have uh, food that's a resource near the surface because photosynthesis happens near the surface. So light controls the space and the geography inside of which ecosystems in the midwater water uh, move, evolve and grow. Wow, what a novel concept. And, and how sensitive is the radiometer? Uh, and what are the steps that you take in developing a tool like that? Yeah, so the, uh, the, the, it's kind of difficult to, to communicate uh, purely verbally uh, just how, how, how sensitive uh, the radiometer is. So um, the, the, if you think of the sunlight at the surface, okay, and it's just some amount of light. So as you go deeper in the water, water, we think of water as transparent. It's not transparent, right? Water absorbs light. And as you go deeper and deeper, less and less of the light makes it down. And as you go hundreds of feet, thousands of feet, thousands of meters into the water, the, wa the water has absorbed and extinguished the light from the surface. And, and to get a sense for how much, um, by the time you go from the surface to about 800 meters down, which is about as deep as the, the fish that we, we know and love at the surface ever dive, um, and it's the bottom of what we call the twilight zone. When you get about 800 meters down, there are a million, million fewer, million, uh, sorry, a thousand billion times fewer, a trillion fewer photons at, at that depth than there are at the surface. What that means to put it in perspective is take all, take the, the, the number of photons that go through, uh, uh, you know, your, your outstretched arms, okay? And ask if you took your outstretched arms and you put them 800 meters down, how many bits of light would be going through your outstretched arms? It's one in, a one followed by 12 zeros. To give you a sense of how that is, if you took every human on the planet and you said only one of them, pick one, what are the odds that it turns out it's my cousin Wanka in Colombia, right? It's, it's one in 10 billion. That's a hundred times better odds than one of those little bits of light at the surface making it to 800 meters, okay? It's really, really unlikely that light makes it down there, which is why the fish go there. Right? They start at the surface and they're eating. That's where the food is produced. But if they stick around, a big tuna or a sailfish or whatever is going to come and eat them. So they dive deep where they can't be seen. 
That's absolutely incredible. And I love your <laughs> example of what, what this actually looks like. These animals that are diving super deep and, and avoiding predation, you know, at, at upper levels, have they developed special adaptations to survive in these conditions? They certainly have. So imagine imagine you're a predator, right? And you, you've you discovered that the all the fish that you know and love aren't there during the day. They're only there at night. Um, well, you could just go find them during the day, right? And so what if you've got you know, big schools of fish and they're at 400 meters down, let's say. It's pretty dark for you. You and I wouldn't be able to see anything. Pitch black. But a giant, you know, why do the swordfish, why do a sailfish, why do they have giant eyes? Because they dive down 600 meters, 800 meters, and they look up. And they look in the middle of the day for shadows because a shadow isn't a cloud, it's a school of fish. And up they go, they go up to 40 meters, they cruise around, eat all the fish, go back up to the surface, warm up and do it again. And they become these giant, huge predators because they're just soaking up the biomass. Now, if you're that little fish at 400 meters, right? You really don't want to get eaten. You know what you do? You evolve. And in particular, you evolve a glowing belly that has the ability to cancel off your shadow, to counter illuminate to, so that your glow and the glow from the school of fish around you cancels off the shadow you catch from the sun. Well, that's pretty good, but now there's an evolutionary battle, right? The tuna or the sailfish or you know, swordfish, all the, the predators that want to eat you, now when they look up, they don't see that shadow. But here's the thing, your glowing belly, it doesn't shine exactly the same light as the sun. And so these predators, they don't have one or two or three cones and rods like we do. They have dozens. So they can see a dozen different shades of blue. Right. And they can tell like that is not the sun. That is a, a shadow being canceled by a bunch of jellies or by a bunch of, of fish counter illuminating a bunch of, of, of tophids or whatnot. And um, and so there's this evolutionary battle between the incredible resolving power of the retina of these deep water predators and the glowing belly precision of these midwater creatures. So, yeah, it's a pretty spectacular biological story. It sounds like a deep sea superhero power. <laughs> um, <laughs> like it I is. want that power. Uh, totally. yeah. So you're you're collecting all of this data, um, and it's absolutely incredible. What's your goal in measuring and learning from this data? I mean, what do you hope to accomplish from that? From what it is that you're gathering? Yeah, I think there are a bunch of answers to that. So one is just a straight up scientific question: What is the role of light in the behavior of these animals? We know that during the day. Uh, most of these small predators dive deep, and at night, a whole bunch of them come back up to the surface to feed. Just like this video is showing us, when the sun is there, the, these grazers hide deep. The problem is, m a lot of them don't. If you actually look at the data, what we see is that a lot of them come up, and a lot of them do not. And we know it's more complicated than just following the light levels, because there's also bathymetry. There's also the fact that in some places you're shallow, in some places you're deep. There's also the behavior of other animals. So it's a complicated thing. What is actually the role of light in this story? So there's a really interesting scientific story. To my mind, though, there's another important story here, which is that, look, there's a lot of fish in the ocean, right? And in particular, um, it, you know, if you would asked 15 years ago uh, a biologist, what's the most populous vertebrate on the planet? They would have said the domesticated chicken. They're like, you know, 10 billion of them. We eat a lot of chicken. So, and there are a lot more of them than there are of us, it turns out. So, okay, so, but now if you ask what's the most populous vertebrate on the planet, it's these bristlemouth, these fish that do this dial migration, this daily migration into the deep water by orders of magnitude more populous. Now, people haven't been fishing them, right? But now they are. And one of the things that really disturbs me is that for very good reasons, people need protein, people need oils. There are fleets going out and trawling the midwater. And we don't know the biology. We don't know the ecology. We don't know the time scales for reproduction. We don't know what anything like maintenance of a stock looks like. This is unknown territory. We don't know even what drives the animal's most basic behavior. When do they feed and when do they not? And the idea that we're gonna go out and on an industrial global scale, meddle with that ecosystem, which by the way, controls the carbon transport and the oxygen transport in the midwater in many ways. That worries me. And I think research like this is a way of putting our fingers into the story, getting some friction and understanding what's going on. And we need that understanding before we can do things like intelligently regulate and, and protect the fisheries, right? The, the people who are going out and trawling, they don't, their goal isn't to destroy the ecosystems. Their goal isn't to cause trouble in the carbon transport system. Their goal is to feed people. I can get behind that, but we need to do it in a way that is protective of the long-term health of the ecosystem for all of us. 
Absolutely. And it sounds like we're on track to learning so much more about the Midwater. I can't wait to see what this expedition brings. And that's a great segue into speaking with uh, Dr. Annette Govindarajan. Um, she's studying the animals themselves. Uh, she is with the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. Annette, you designed the environmental DNA sampling plan for this expedition. First and foremost, what is eDNA and what role does it play in helping us to understand our oceans? Yeah, so um, eDNA or environmental DNA refers to like the traces of, of DNA that, that animals leave behind as they are moved through the water column. It's, it's kind of like an animal forensic. So basically animals shed cells or um, feces or um, gametes or, you know, little bits and pieces of these animals and that, that contain traces of their DNA. And so, so we call that environmental DNA or eDNA, and we can sample that the water that contains these little traces, and we can actually get the DNA sequences from those from those water samples, and that we can use that to tell us what the animals were that that those traces originated from. So it's like an exciting new forensics approach for the ocean. Absolutely, and and how does this exciting new forensics approach work? How how do we collect it? And how does the eDNA sampler do its job? Sure. Um, yeah. So, so, so again, we're collecting the the, the water, uh, the, the the traces of the DNA in the, in the water, and not the animals themselves. So, what we need to do is we get the water sample, and we have to filter it through a filter. And then, what we do is um, then preserve that filter and extract the DNA from that. So. So that's the, the traditional way to do this is when you actually get a physical water sample, right? And then you bring that up to the ship and you, you filter it on board the ship. But what we have here on this cruise is the new technology of the eDNA sampler that will actually filter the water in situ, right? So right on the Mizabat, right there with that, as you could see in, in the footage that you showed earlier, you can see that um, it's actually taking and filtering the water right there um, and so then when the Mesobot comes back on board, um, we just take those filters and then we save them. And we've, we've already got that um, for, the, for the, the next step. Yeah, and let's talk a little bit about how we process these samples. What, what happens once that sample is brought back to the ship and, and how do you do it? So sure, the, the first thing that we do is, is that those, those, need to be, um, those filters need to be preserved and, and brought back to our lab on the shore. And so, um, so we put them in the, the freezer. Erin um, Freights is, is my research assistant on board the cruise and she's leading that. And um, then we will send those samples back on, on dry ice um, back to the lab here in Woods Hole where we'll do DNA extractions from those filters. And then what we do is a, an approach called meta barcoding. And so that refers to like a DNA barcode, which is basically a barcode is a stretch of DNA sequence that for individuals within a species, that barcode sequence is similar or identical, right? But between species, that DNA barcode sequence is, is very different. So then what we can do is we get that DNA barcode sequence. We then compare it to a reference database of, of barcode sequences that originate from animals that we have been accurately that have been accurately identified and then we match our environmental barcodes with that reference library so we can put names on um, our eDNA um, the species that we've detected with the eDNA. Awesome and a lot of that work is done right there in the wet lab which uh, we showed our viewers uh, just a moment ago. Yep, um, yep. <laughs> a lot of time spent there. <laughs> That's right. And one of the things to be really careful of um, when, when you work with eDNA is keeping uh, the, the laboratory clean and sterile because we're dealing with really trace quantities of DNA. And actually, that's another advantage of, of having the sampler is that's less processing that we have to do in the lab because it's done in situ. And that um, actually um, reduces the opportunities for contamination to occur really just thinking about everything in this <laughs> and then once we've processed these samples and and you know looking forward what do we hope to learn from this mission happening in the next week well uh so what we're hoping to do um is 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 to tech demo with our sampler and also to to do that tech demo in the context of this scientific um question of um 
diel vertical migration that that Alan talked about, right? And and also collecting the the light data from the radiometer. So we'll have the eDNA data um, as well as the the sensor data from Mesobot. So that we we hope what we hope to do is to look at um, identifying the the species and 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 the animals that are undertaking diel vertical migration and understand when they're doing it and uh, when they're doing it in the context of the the physical environment. Absolutely. And, and as you said, you know, this is a tech demonstration where just as much as we're collecting samples, we're seeing how all of these things work together. How will this, this mission in itself and overall advance exploration of the deep sea? Well, I think that um, the, the whole eDNA approach is really exciting with a lot of potential because we can learn more uh, about the biodiversity um, than we can through conventional me methods and that we can pick up traces of animals that we might miss through traditional types of sampling, like with net toes. Uh, for example, a lot of gelatinous animals that fall apart in nets, you know, those get overlooked, so they might be underestimated. Um, we might also be missing, you know, detecting, you know, active fishes that, that aren't being sampled. And so eDNA can give us a, 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 a uh, help us get a more comprehensive picture by picking up traces of animals that we might otherwise miss with traditional methods. That's absolutely incredible. I can't, I, I'm just so excited to see what happens next. We do yeah. have um, a viewer question as well. They want to know um, why is it called the Mesobot? And maybe that's, that's a question for Dana and Molly. Um. I mentioned earlier the conversation that uh, uh, Dr. Gwindarajan and I had with Dr. Larry Maiden uh, when the, the idea of the Mesobot was born. Uh, and, and so we started talking about this and a couple of days later I got, uh, I saw Larry again and he says, he said, oh, by the way, I think I have the name. Uh, I think we should call it Mesobot. And uh, it was accepted by all of us by acclamation. So that was it, you know, Mesobot it was. It was Larry's idea, <laughs> and so he got to name it. That's awesome. I mean, that's fair enough, right? <laughs> um, well, this is so exciting, and it's great to see everybody on screen together. Um, what, you know, Alan's back there somewhere. Uh, OET really believes in the power of role modeling, and I really want to know how you all found your way into this work, and, and um, you know, what advice would you give to a middle or high school student who wants to follow your path? And and maybe Molly and Dana, it'd be great to cue you in since you're standing on the back deck and we can pop <laughs> around from there. <laughs> well, I, I, I think uh, certainly in my case and in the case of a lot of the people I work with, you know, there's a there's a lot of serendipity uh, in, in where you end up in your career. Um, you know, uh, I was a postdoc at MIT and my advisor called me up one day and he said, I have a visitor tomorrow. I think he's a little crazy, but I think you might like to meet him. Um, uh, of course, that was that was Dr. Robert Ballard. Uh, and I think I was with Bob for about 12 minutes. I looked up at the clock and I knew what I wanted to do. But, you know, imagine if I slept in that day, um, you know, my whole life would have changed. So uh, uh, I think you have to talk to the right people and it's hard to know, uh, especially in science, people can give you really completely incorrect advice. So you have to find <laughs> people who are really in the game. You have to find the real practitioners of science or engineering and, and take your advice from them. And then you have to be open to those moments of serendipity when some opportunity comes and lands on your lap. Uh, and then you have to seize it. Um, so I, I guess that's my advice. What, how would you put that, Molly? Yeah, so uh, I guess how I went up here was uh, I, I grew up loving the water and I loved um, just building things and fiddling with things and and um, I have some engineers in my family and you know when we when we wanted something whether it was uh, you know a treehouse or whatnot we we would figure out how to build it ourselves um, and I, I really liked uh, when you have a problem being able to uh, solve that yourself and and build it yourself and. And um, so I went to school for engineering and, and I loved it. And about halfway through school, I, I started doing some uh, ocean engineering classes and, and we got to go out on, on this small boat and deploy something. And it was, 
it was super fun and I absolutely loved it. It it actually broke as soon as we put it in the ocean, but uh, <laughs> you know, we learned a lot about it. Um, and uh, you know, like Dana was saying, I, I there was there was not a job opening when I applied, um, but I reached out to the people that did what I wanted to do and and um, you know, I was fortunate enough to uh, to get a position. Um, but I would say, you know, figure out what you want to do uh, and just go after it. Don't wait for a position to open up or or someone to come to you. You've got to, you know, figure out figure out what you want and and go for it. And and you know, if it's not the right thing, go for something else. Yeah, it sounds to I me like you're saying. Amount of, you I'm sorry. You know, a certain amount of tenacity is required. Um, one of my friends who I gave him his first engineering job, and he's a professor at MIT now. And he had advice to people. He said, you know, if you want to get a job with Dana, just go wait outside his office until he shows up. <laughs> um, you know, there's a certain <clears throat> relentlessness that you need to succeed. Uh, you can't be bashful. Uh, and you got to figure out what you want. And and you have to politely and, uh, you know, you, you have, always have to uh, behave properly in the workplace. But yet you have to be assertive as well. And that's, that's very important. Equal parts serendipity and tenacity, it sounds like. <laughs> um, Alan, I saw you clapping down there in the corner when uh, when Dana was telling his story about just sort of fate and, and you know, having that equal amount. What do you, what was your story? I mean, and what advice do you give to students? Yeah, well, um, uh, there's no such thing as a career arc, right? It's just a long series of shocking surprises to everyone. So um, so there's this idea, especially in, in education, academia, that there's a path and it's predetermined and it's not. So my, my path was completely conventional in the sense that it's never conventional. So I, I was born in Colombia. We moved to Texas when I was a kid. Um, I moved to Massachusetts for college. Uh, I went to California for grad school. I went to India for a postdoc. I came back to Boston and I got a faculty job at MIT. And the whole time I was studying theoretical physics, string theory, I was studying black holes, you know, useful practical stuff. And then, um, and then on the side, I, I had a uh, sort of hobby. I like diving and I got to know some photographers and I started doing underwater photography and I ended up shooting some high speed underwater footage for the New England Aquarium. And, and so I had, I had this, I was a professor of string theory and, and I had a hobby in underwater high speed imaging. Cool. And then this very surprising thing happened, which is that my first son was born. And, you know, that was awesome. <laughs> And then, of course, the inevitable, then the second son was born. And it turned out that they really love the ocean, right? They love the ocean. And all of a sudden, for the first time, I had the sense this, that uh, the ocean that I was leaving them really mattered and that I was responsible for it. In a way, you know, blah, 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 we're all responsible for the environment, but like it mattered all of a sudden to me in a different way. And so long story short, um, I, uh, I became an oceanographer. I left my career. I started... Um, uh, building to, I, I left my job in physics at MIT and I started a lab at MIT building instruments for ocean exploration. And, uh, and I got to do, I got to go out on the Nautilus. This is a, an image of, of me on the Nautilus that, hello. So I've had a couple of cruises deploying a, a deep ocean 360 imaging system that's on Herc. Um, and holy cow, I love the Nautilus. Let me just say, so, um, so I've had some amazing adventures. And then speaking to Dana's point about serendipity, I was at, uh, our buddies, uh, a company visiting him. He's a professor at, at MIT and he was starting a company. I was over visiting and he said, hey, Alan, you really need to meet this guy, uh, uh, Dana, come over here. And Dana was over there working with some electronics and he came over, oh, who are you? We started talking and he's like, oh, you should come down to my office at, at Woods Hole. So years passed now, I, you know, I have him jointly appointed at Woods Hole and I've just left MIT to start a nonprofit building instruments for ocean exploration. None of which was what I intended. None of which was what I trained for. But the value of a good education isn't you know, a list of facts, or is it just a list of facts? It's a sense that you can tackle real intellectually challenging problems and that you shouldn't be scared of it. You should just take it seriously and, and give it the hard work it deserves. So the point about serendipity and tenacity, yeah, 100%. There's, there's no such thing as the right background. There's just the right attitude and hunger. This is one of my favorite parts of these conversations is just hearing where people came from and how they wound up, you know, in their role on the Nautilus because it is so diverse. And that, what was your path? I mean, did you take this sort of non-conventional, conventional, conventional <laughs> linear, non-linear approach? 
Um, well, I'd say I always knew I wanted to be a marine biologist or a scientist and since I was as long as I can remember. Uh, specifically marine biology, I got interested in in the eighth grade. I um, was in a class trip to the Bermuda Biological Station and that I was hooked <laughs> at that point. And then I um, pretty much had a straight path. This is what I want to do. What really fascinates me is looking at the diversity of animal life. I'm, um, I, love, I love just exploring the the variety of the of the types of, of animals and 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 trying to understand the the patterns and processes that that shape that diversity and um and and towards that end like i have found like using molecular methods um offers a lot of of insight to that and so that's what i would recommend is that having a foundation with a molecular um, approaches and what because sometimes and one of the mo most exciting things is is sometimes when we see animals that that look alike we start looking at the genetic level and we realize that they're actually quite different and um and sometimes even to the point of being different species and one of the highlights for me was i once um helped describe a new species of jellyfish and that was um, one of my more exciting <laughs> projects um and this is where i feel like edna is kind of a natural direction for that because again we're, we're it's allowing us to look at this diversity of of life out there and that's just super exciting for me it is. And what was the name of that jellyfish? <laughs> it's a Gonionemus uh, agilis. It's, it's a little uh, type of clinging jellyfish in Australia. <laughs> Very cool. Well, this, it was so great to hear where you all came from, um, you know, and sort of these backgrounds and how people can wind up in science and especially ocean science from so many different backgrounds. Going forward, um, what's next for the mess about it? And maybe that's a question again for Dana and Molly, since you're standing right next to it. Where is this brand new technology going to go once it's done on the Nautilus? I see Mesobot as a prototype. This is the first one. You know, it costs a lot of money, uh, uh, mostly because of the people time required to, 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 to make it happen, as well as the components. But we can imagine, we can learn from this vehicle, uh, what what is it that these vehicles do really well, okay? And then we can work, actually, we can partner with our friends in industry, which we have a little bit on this vehicle already, um, and we can figure out how to produce <clears throat> those same scientific capabilities a lot less expensively and a lot more accessibly. I know that uh, Alan Adams, uh, the, the new nonprofit Oceanic Labs that he started, has the goal of, of getting over this these huge financial barriers that we have where something costs a million dollars, okay, and we can have one of them. Well, Alan will tell you if he can make hundreds of them, the cost will plummet, okay? Uh, and that's where we need to get to uh, with a lot of systems in the ocean. Um, and so I see the Mesobot as, you know, the kind of expensive one of that then inspires the next generation of a lot uh, more accessible, more available, less expensive technology that can do similar work. Absolutely. And I probably speak for all of us when I say I'm so excited to see what comes of this expedition and what comes of the future for Mesobot. It is just an, a phenomenal piece of technology and it's gonna bring us so much more enlightenment to the Midwater. Um, so Dana, Molly, Annette, Alan, thank you so much for joining us today. I know it's a busy first day on this expedition and you took the time out to hop on this call and, and give us all a heads up of what's coming up for the expedition. Um, our thanks also goes out to the NOAA Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute for their partnership in bringing all of these wonderful teams together for this technology teaching, uh, testing rather. Uh, you can join us all weekend on NautilusLive.org where you'll see different opportunistic data feeds from the technology testing and see the team in action on the back deck. And on Monday, you can join us back here for another live Q&A with the engineers and onboard team from the hybrid AUV ROV NUI. Um, that's on board from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, and we'll be hopping on live with them at noon Eastern to answer your questions about their early progress in these testing dives and to see how testing AUV RO ROV mode has been going. If you like hanging out with us today, be sure to like and subscribe and like this channel. Give, share it with your friends. Keep exploring with us at nautiluslive.org. We will see you there. <laughs>